scripture passage today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 15, looking at verses 34 to 44, and then 51 to 58. Now, before we do that, let's uh, pause for a moment in prayer. Good and gracious Father, Lord, we come before your word, seeking uh, your ways, Lord, your inspiration, your truth to be spoken into our hearts. And Father, we cannot understand these things unless the spirit that inspired these words would inspire us again. So, Lord, I pray you breathe your Holy Spirit out upon us, that as we hear, that as we read, that we will also understand. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 44 and 51 to 58. Listen now to the word of the Lord. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Behold, I will tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised in perishable and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the, imper when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to say, pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is thy victory? Where, O death, is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Happy Mother's Day. And I'd like to just mention before we sing the song that, that we were so thankful for the mothers that we have and then those mothers that are no longer with us and that we, we keep them in our hearts and our prayers and they live through us with our memories and our cherished loved ones. Don't even try 
take you back to maybe some uh, English lit class for a minute. Maybe it was high school, maybe it was college. And what if you remember a guy by the name of Edward Arlington Robinson. He was a poet that you probably studied in English lit sometime, maybe you've already forgotten it by now, maybe you forgot it as soon as you heard it, but Edward Arlington Robinson and a poem he wrote called Miniver Chibi. And what was neat about this poem, Miniver Chibi, is, a, is about a guy who's on his porch and he believes that he was born in the wrong time. He believes that he was born in the completely wrong time, that he should have been born in the Middle Ages. And the time that he's born in is now boring, it's terrible, and his life is not good as it was then. And so he, he's on his porch and he's dreaming in the Middle Ages of, of knights with, on a, with the armor and swords and, and damsels in distress. And, and he's just dreaming that that's, oh, that's when life was real. It was good then. That's when it was, it was a good time to be alive, not this boring age that he found himself in then. And the poem Minivar Chibi ends like this. 
Miniver Chibi, born too late, scratched his head and kept on thinking. Miniver coughed and called it fate and kept on drinking. So though Miniver, at the end of this poem, he, he just find out he's just sitting on his porch getting drunk and dreaming of a better time to live. The words hit a chord. They hit a chord for a lot of us. Because many of us have felt a similar sentiment that maybe that we were born out of time. And maybe we don't belong here at all. Maybe you're like Miniver and, and myself who seem to favor the Middle Ages, or maybe you thought life would have been better if you would have lived in the Roaring Twenties or the Victorian era or the Renaissance or, or the Age of Exploration, that, that the time that we live in now is boring and dull and doesn't have a lot for you, and you were better off if you were born in an earlier age. Or maybe a sentiment that most of us feel, almost every one of us has felt at some point in our life, is that we don't belong. Not just don't belong in time, that we just don't belong. We just don't feel like that we fit in for some reason. And we look around at the people around us and everyone else seems to have it figured out. Everyone else seems to have found their place in the world. Everybody else is happy and they're out there living their best life. And we are the only ones that haven't got a clue about what we're supposed to do or what's going on. Have you ever felt like that? Ever had, had that sentiment that you don't belong, that you're a foreigner, that you're out of place, that you are the only one that doesn't belong? Well, if you've ever felt that way, I've got good news for you. If you ever felt that you don't belong, I'm here to tell you, you're right. That's right. You're right. You are 100% right. You don't belong. Now look, this is an insult, okay? This is not an insult, okay? Just bear with me for a minute. I think it's a good thing that you don't belong. In fact, I think it's a very good thing that you don't belong. But the problem we have with feeling like we don't belong, okay, is not a problem with the world. The world, believe me, has plenty of problems. But the fact that you don't belong in it or feel like you don't belong is not one of the problems with the world. The problem of you not feeling like you belong is not a problem with the world. It's not a problem with other people. It's a you problem. Again, not an insult, okay? I don't want you to take that the wrong way. It is a you problem. The reason why you can't fully fit in the reason why you sometimes feel like you don't belong is because you are not the person that you're supposed to be. The you as you exist right now are not the person that you're supposed to be or even the person you, you are meant to be. Or rather, you're not that person yet. And as you exist right now, as you exist in this time or place, you can't fully fit in. You can't perfectly find your place. And you're going to struggle your whole life with being perfectly happy. You're going to struggle your whole life with finding that perfect sense of contentment that, okay, you get it here and now, you get it for a moment, then it's gone just the next moment. And you're stuck searching for that one thing that you're never going to find. And you're going to do this for your life because you are not the you that you're supposed to be. You are not the you that you're supposed to be. Now look, okay, I know what that sounds like, okay? I know it sounds like I just hit you with a little mix of some Eastern mystic shamanism with a little bit of Joel Osteen sprinkled in for good measure. But let me explain. Let me explain what I mean when I say you are not the you that you're supposed to be. Because of that, you don't fit in and you don't really belong. Well, to understand that first, you need to understand some key doctrines. I need to, to get you to speed on some key Christian doctrines. And the doctrine specifically I'm talking about is one that's in our Apostles' Creed. Now, if you've been coming here for a while, you know that we have been going over the points of the Apostles' Creed, which is a creedal statement which explains the basic foundations of Christian belief. And there's 12 points to it, and we are at the next to the last point today, and it is the doctrine that says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection of the body. 
Now at this point, I need to clear up to you some misconceptions that we have about the afterlife and about eternal life and how one day we are going to spend eternal life. Now, as most people believe it, and this isn't all wrong, okay? But as most people believe it, when a person dies, right, their soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, the soul, spirit, that essential part of us that animates us, that gives us life, our personality, gets separated out from a body, right? The body then we bury in the ground and we cremate it, then the spirit, soul, rises into heaven and it's up there in his heaven and it's up there with God forever in heaven. And that's how we spend eternity. Now, this is, 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 is so been ingrained in us. Everybody in church usually believes that the interpretation of life after death. And it's even portrayed like that in popular culture. If you see a movie, a person dies and they're showing you a snapshot of heaven. There they are, the soul leaving the body, going up to heaven. Maybe they've got their harp and their wings. They're sitting on a cloud playing. And, you know, we're all having a good time, eating grapes and walking around streets of gold in our mansions that God has given us, and that's how we spend eternity. That's not completely right. Okay, it is true that when you die, your soul and spirit are separated from the body. The body goes to the ground, and the soul or the spirit goes up to heaven to be with the Lord. But that is not a completely permanent situation. That is not going to last forever. We are not going to be disembodied spirits living in heaven forever. For what the scriptures tell us and what our faith believes is at the end of the age, when Christ returns, there's going to be a resurrection of the body. Now, if you want to get some details about the resurrection, the best place to, to, to get some in, good information about it is uh, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole, the whole chapter is about the, is about the resurrection. I wish I could have read the whole thing. We go through it, but we don't have near enough time to do that. But the resurrection of the body. And it's just like it sounds, okay? Look at verse 52. It tells us, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. Now, I want you to just remember that. We shall all be changed. But for the moment, it just says that the dead will be raised imperishable. Now, we also get another snapshot. I had it written down. Yes, here it is. On um, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So what we have happening, it says that there's this, this trumpet that's going to sound, and, this, and, and the trumpet of God is going to be a signal when the age has finally come to an end. And it's when all these things that God has ordained to happen are going to happen. When, when, when the world and history come to its final culminating end. And what we're told early in Corinthians is this is going to happen when Jesus conquers all his enemies. He says every enemy that Jesus has is going to be conquered. And when he only has one enemy left to conquer, and that is death, that is when he's going to return. There's going to be this trumpet blowing, and the dead are going to be raised to new life. Now, at that point, we're going to have what is called the last judgment. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. You can go look at that, uh, look at that video from a few weeks ago to see you know, a little more information about that. But today we're talking about the resurrection. So the, the dead are going to be raised. And when I say the dead are raised, everybody, everybody, every single person that has lived and died is going to be raised to life again. Every single person that has lived and died, their spirit and soul is going to reunite with that body again, and that body is going to come again to new life. Every battlefield that has dead people in it, all those dead are going to rise. Okay, if you go to a, a cemetery with all the coffins, every single one is going to break open, and the dead are going to rise. Every person that's been cremated, all right, and their ashes scattered, their scattered remains are going to come back again to a form a new body. Revelation even says that the sea is going to give up the dead. All, everyone that has died in the ocean, drowned, they're going to be rising up out of the sea and come to life again. And at that point, they will gather for the judgment of Christ. The righteous will go on to eternal life, and we'll talk about more eternal life next week. And the unrighteous to a place called the lake of fire, and we don't want to talk about that. But the point being is we don't exist in heaven forever as these disembodied spirits. There is a time, and God has ordained this time, where we are going to be reunited with our bodies. And this is the manner in which we will truly spend eternal life. 
in new resurrected bodies. Now, I know the question that's on your mind right now. It's the question everyone thinks of when I says, we are going to all have resurrected bodies. First thing people want to know is, okay, what kind of body am I getting? That's what I want to know. Is it the same body I got now? And if it's the same body I got now, is it old me or is it going to be young me? Me as a kid? Me at the time I died? I mean, my grandmother, for instance, okay, this month she's going to be 103. Right? I can guarantee you at the resurrection she's not going to want a 103-year-old version of herself. If you ask me personally, I'm thinking around 25 maybe. You know, if I could pick, that might be a good time. My body was okay then. Not as bad as it was now. <laughs> I didn't always look like this, I promise. But that's what we want to know. What, what kind of body are we getting? Is it the old body, young? Is it going to be a new body completely? Is it going to be recognizable to people? If we have infirmities, if we have like, chronic diseases or illnesses, do those bodies come with us as well? And that's a great question if you're asking that. And that was a question people were even asked Paul when he first wrote these. And he, he writes us and he gives us a bit of an idea of what kind of bodies it is. Look at verse 36 and 37. He says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Okay, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. So when Paul wants to describe what kind of bodies we're going to have at the resurrection, he gives us this analogy of a seed of a seed that you plant. And if you ever planted a garden or planted seed, you know exactly how this works. You, you, you take a seed and you sow it. And sowing it means just putting it in the ground. You take a seed, you put it in the ground, and, and that seed actually dies. That's what Jesus says. A kernel of wheat has to fall on the ground and die before it can become something different. And so you take the seed, you put it in the ground, the seed dies, and then by the miracle of life, a new plant emerges from the seed. And so you've got this one seed that goes in the ground, and what happens to it is it's transformed and it's changed completely into completely something different. But it all comes from the same seed. Let me, let me give you an example. I don't know, you probably can't even see this. These are like little tomato seeds. And, 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 and they're tiny, tiny little seeds. They're these kind of like light brown, these seeds. And if you see them, you even see them in your tomato when you eat them. You don't even pay attention to them. You know, we just eat them, but they're these tiny little seeds. And one day, what happens is this tiny little seed turns into this. And, and you look at the seed and you're like, this looks nothing like this. I mean, this looks nothing like this at all. And even this doesn't even look like, like this, which comes out of the seed one day. All of this stuff, this tiny little seed ends up growing this big plant and and, you know, there's even smaller seeds and bigger plants. You look at a little tiny little acorn, comes into this, this giant big oak. And this looks so different from this, but this came from this. This, this seed here is what makes this great big plant here. They look different, but the potential, the potential for this is already inside this tiny little seed. The potential to become everything you see here is in the seed. The potential to become this, to become a nice tasty tomato, is already inside the seed. You can't see it. And, and looking at the seed, you would no way think, oh yeah, yeah, this is going to become a tomato and a tomato plant. Unless you're a scientist and you've studied this and you recognize it, but, but just, just using human reason and sight, you look at it and there's like, nah, that, that's not going to become anything. That's just a little dot. It's this tiny little kernel here, but there's something great inside this little seed. There's something wonderful that's hiding inside this little seed. And what the Apostle Paul tells us is that it is the same with the resurrection of the body. Paul says the body you sow is not the body that's going to come. He says it's like a seed. So, so what we have is we have us, these bodies we have now, they're just seeds. You and I, everybody you see, everything we've ever been is a seed. And like all seeds is one day going to die, we're going to put it into the earth. And the time and the day of the Lord is going to come and we're going to rise to new life. 
And we're going to rise into something different. But it comes out of the seed of our bodies that we walk around with and we use right now. It's not going to be the same kind of body, but it's going to come out of this body. Paul says the body that's to come is going to be imperishable. The one we have now is perishable, not imperishable. And that means it's never going to die. He says the body we have now is, is, is full of dishonor. The new one we're going to get is going to be full of glory. The one we have now is a body of weakness. The one we're going to get is going to be a body of power. It's not going to be completely like the one we have now, but probably there is going to be some sort of resemblance. The, the only, only example we get of what these bodies might look like is, is from Jesus when he rose from the dead. He's, he's the only one that's passed through this process that we're all going to go through one day. And when Jesus rose from the dead at first, Mary didn't recognize him at all. He'd only been dead three days. And she sees him in the garden. She thinks that he's a gardener or somebody else. And she doesn't recognize him at first because he's, he's, he's changed. He's become different. But as soon as, as Jesus says her, na her name, it says Mary. It just says Mary, one word. And all of a sudden, like the lights are on and she recognizes him. Which shows us that the body's going to be different than the body we have now, but it's also going to be recognizable. You'll be able to recognize your friends, your family, your loved one, anyone you've lost, you'll be able to recognize them, even though they look different. But Paul says that the body we're going to have is going to be a body not of weakness, but a body of power. Which means there's going to be no infirmities, there's going to be no weaknesses, no handicaps, no pains. And let me tell you also, there's going to be no body insecurity. Okay, that's going to be done. It says the body we have now is a body of dishonor. The body we're going to get is going to be a body of glory. Which means all of you are going to look glorious. It's going to be fantastic. No one's ever told me I've looked glorious before. I mean, the best I've gotten is, you look pretty good. Not so bad. But when you see me later, you're like, man, you look glorious. And you're going to look glorious. No, you look glorious. No, you look glorious. That's a great way to look, glorious. But I want you to understand that right now that we are nothing but seeds. That's what we are. In this life here, we're nothing but seeds. This body, this life, it's not meant, this is not who we're truly meant to be. This is not our true self. But just like you got this little seed, this little tiny seed here, and its true self is this big plant. It's in here right now. And your true self, your true being, sleeps inside you. Dreams inside you. Still being formed, still being fashioned by the hand of our creator. That's why we feel like we need to find ourselves so many times. That's why we feel lost, out of place, out of time, not yet finished. Because we are not yet finished. We are all incomplete. And your true self is not something you have to go out and discover like kind of Jack Kerouac journey. It's not something you discover. Your true self is something you become. Because we're not just getting new bodies. We're becoming new people. And you're even going to get a new name. In Revelation 2.17, it says, To those who conquer, I will give a stone, this white stone, that will be written a name on it, and no one knows the name except the one who receives it. And so at this time of the Lord, this time of when our bodies are resurrected, and we have our glorious bodies, Christ will give us this stone, this white stone, and on that stone is going to be a name, and that is your true name. And when we look at that, we look at that stone for the first time and see that name, you and I and all of us, we're going to have the biggest aha moment we've ever had in our life. You're going to look at that name and you're going to say, yes, that's it. That's who I am. I've, I've, I've known it all along. I've known it because it's been there. It's been like a word on the tip of my tongue, but that is who I am. That is my real self finally revealed for the first time. And that name is in you right now. That self is in you right now. And I believe this is what causes us to feel like we don't belong sometimes. Because we feel like we're in this world. But we're not of this world. 
we feel like we're in this world, but we really don't belong here because we were all of us, all of us made for something else. We were all of us made for something greater. We were all of us made for a glory that this world as it is cannot truly understand and it could not even hold. So the sense of belonging, the sense of not belonging is not a problem with the world. It's a problem with you. Because you really don't belong here. You really belong somewhere else. You really belong, well, as somebody else. So if you come to me and say, well, I don't feel like I belong, my answer to you is going to be, congratulations. That means you're one of us. It also means you have a lot to look forward to. Because for now, we may be exiles. We may be wanderers. We may feel like strangers in our own homes, our own lands, and even strangers in our own bodies. But for now, we're left with this vague sense of longing. Mixed in with a lot of hope. That life can be better. That life is meant to be better. Life is meant to be something more than we experience it right now. That life can be every bit as good as we dream. And if you think so, you're right. Because that dream is the true self within you. Longing to come to full life. I'm going to leave you with these words from another poet. This is one by the name of Khalil Gibran. And this is from a book of his called The Prophet. And in it he writes, In the depth of your hopes and desires lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust the dreams, for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.